Right. Well, here I am with my dear friend, Pastor Tony Clark, and Tony is in Newport News, Virginia. And Tony, I just wanted to have a talk with you briefly about Black History Month. It is Black History Month. And, um, you know, something I found out that was interesting was the reason why a Black History Month is in February is because they wanted to have it in the month of um, the birthdays of both Frederick Douglass and Abraham Lincoln. And I yeah. thought, wow, that yeah. that is very interesting. So yeah. um, Black History Month, you know, I think for some people, I think uh, they think it's something that just started. You know, maybe maybe <laughs> right. in maybe in right. 2020, <laughs> you know, they just <laughs> that Black History Month would would be a thing. Uh, but Black History Month goes back to 1926, and um, there was a a man. It was it originally began as Negro History Week, and there was mm-hmm. a man named Carter G. Woodson. He was a noted African American historian, scholar, educator. And publisher, so he was the one who came up with the idea that you know we we need to just take a week and kind of just celebrate, you know, sure what the the contributions of African Americans to American society. Um, it became a month long celebration in 1976. So yeah, all that to say, Ford. yeah, all that to say, this has been a thing for quite some time. So it's not like people are jumping on the bandwagon because it's the thing to do. Uh, This has been around for a long time. Yeah, it really has. There were some educators and the Black Student Union uh, at Kent University in 1969 that really began to lobby for uh, there being a Black History Month. Of course, back in the 20s, uh, you know, that was that that time period, it wasn't going to take off. But it wasn't until, like you said, President Ford in 1976 that made it uh, official. So, yes, you're, you're definitely right with that. Yeah. Now, did you. OK, so growing up, you grew up in Gary, Indiana. Um, yes. Was was Black History Month on your radar as a kid? I mean, was it something that you guys talked about, celebrated as a family? Oh, yeah. You know, definitely. I took. I took black history in high school. Okay. And so uh, for me, I made straight A's in black history. And Mm -hmm. so uh, I was very familiar with a lot of the stories that are coming out right now because I took it in high school Mm -hmm. and I just really was baffled uh, at this particular course because it wasn't taught in my American history that I made A's and B's out of. It wasn't taught there. It wasn't until I got to the black history class Mm. that I saw saw the uh, contributions of blacks in America. So uh, there was the, what is commonly called the whitewashing of of American history that Mm -hmm. I saw uh, when I took the two classes. Yeah. So, okay, so fast forward. So you you become a Christian uh, at a certain point. I mean, you know, you kind of grew up maybe with a little bit of a religious background, but sure, you sure. really really came to know Jesus. Did you come to the Lord before you went into the Marine Corps, or was it uh, during or after? It was right when I got into the Marine Corps, and right. I got shipped to Okinawa, Japan in 1985, that a Marine assigned to check me into the island. Uh, shared shared the gospel with me, wow. and I accepted Christ as my Lord and Savior. Yeah, uh, August twenty six, nineteen eighty five. Yep, and then um, a couple of years later, you came uh, Camp Pendleton, and yeah, that's when we met. Yeah, yeah, uh, September nineteen eighty six. I got to Camp Pendleton. Yep, and then that's when I got introduced to K Wave. Yep. on the radio. And then uh, I was at a uh, black Pentecostal church uh, for four years. And then 1989 is when I got to Calvary Vista. Right. OK. All right. So here, here's the question. Um, why should or do you think it's important that um, Christians in general, white Christians, um, more specifically, should be interested in Black History Month. Now, I say that because some people say, 
Uh, you know, there, there's controversy around this. Some people say, oh, you know, you start talking black and white and brown and you're just stirring up yeah. problems and that's racist itself because we're we're neither Jew nor Greek nor male nor female. You know, there's no black or white or any of that. So why, why do you make a big deal out of this stuff? How do you respond to that? Well, I, and I have responded to that and it's gotten me, uh, I was to say, into some trouble in the sense that a lot of those invitations that I used to get to speak around the country uh, got cut off because I began to speak about those things and how telling them how Galatians 3.28 is taken out of context with them. But I think that I think that Christians should celebrate, um, you know, Black History Month in general, number one, for awareness. Yeah. They will begin to see that there is a contribution that Blacks made in Christianity, such as Tertullian, um, such as uh, Augustine or Augustine, uh, Athanasius, Origen, Clement. They were all Black. Uh, in first, I mean, in Acts chapter 13, verse one, there were blacks that were part of the early church council. So there are blacks throughout the uh, New Testament and throughout church history, very well known blacks that people didn't know that they were African in, in nature. So number one, it brings, it brings uh, an awareness to them of how blacks contributed to Christianity in this history. Then number two, there's a relatability. You begin to relate to other black brothers and sisters instead of quoting them Galatians 3.28 and saying, you know, you're being divisive. You can now have conversations with them. And, and I think that it'll be a, a, a beautiful thing to see. I think also Jesus bridged the gap between Jew and Gentile in John chapter four and verse four. He said he needed to go through Samaria. Well, Jesus, not really. You can go around through Perea like all the other Jews did. You didn't need to go through Samaria. But he said, yes, I did. I needed to. And he bridged uh, the gap between uh, Jew and Samaritan. And then Paul, Paul constantly tried to bridge the gap between Jew and Gentile. And so um, we see also that um, there was a celebration of cultural holidays in the New Testament. Jesus celebrated a cultural holiday. It's called Hanukkah in the Feast of Lights in John chapter 10. And then there was the Feast of Purim that, that the Jews celebrate. It wasn't a holiday in the Old Testament, but it was a cultural holiday. Mm -hmm. And so here we have the cultural holiday uh, well, Black History Month, one one little month. And it's sad that we had to have that month because as time was going on, no one was acknowledging the contributions that Blacks were making, not only in the building of this nation where many Blacks believe we built America, uh, but also in um, church history as well. And then there's the last thing is there's Juneteenth, uh, which is June um, you know, 19th, uh, 1865, when in Galveston, Texas, that their blacks down there had to be told that, mm -hmm. guess what? The slaves are free. And it took two years for the uh, news to get down to Galveston, Texas, mm -hmm. that January 1st, 1863, Ab Abraham, uh, Abraham Lincoln freed the slaves and they didn't even know it. And yeah. So there's a celebration of that uh, called Juneteenth, June 19th, mm -hmm. that is celebrated e every year. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. And, and you know, I think, too, um, you know, I, I really do feel, and this is something that I think Christians need to be aware of, especially uh, white Christians, is that, um, you know, the, the church itself, unfortunately, was complicit in uh, slavery and um, be after slavery, the Jim Crow uh, situation. I mean, those are historical facts. And uh, yeah. I think that I think recognizing Black History Month on the part of the church um, would is, you know, Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers. And I yes. think it's a way of of seeking reconciliation or, or showing people that you yeah. do that you do care that those things that happened yes. in history, uh, those were wrong. They were bad. They were they were contrary to everything that Jesus taught, everything the gospel is about, and to just say, you know, by acknowledging um, the contribution of black Americans and so forth, you're just saying, you know, 
sorry for all of that horrible stuff and we we appreciate you we're we're thankful for you so yeah i think it's an important thing okay last question um who would you i mean maybe there's more than one but let's just say because it's a time to acknowledge uh contributions from black people into all different aspects of life and society and so forth who would you want to acknowledge? Who would you want to say to people, hey, this is a person that um, I really admire, appreciate, I'm thankful for. You should know about this person. You know, it's funny that you you say that because unfortunately, Black History Month it has only gone back as far as the civil rights era uh, which is 1954 to 1968. We, uh, during this month, there's Martin Luther King Jr. movies, Malcolm X, and, and, you know, Rosa Parks, and then there's Emmett Till that some may or may not know about. Uh, but, you know, I was thinking about this, and I said, okay, there's a guy that people need to know about. His name is Mansa Musa. Mansa Musa was the king of Mali in about 1317 to 1337. He was the richest man who ever lived. He was the king of Mali. He was estimated of being worth $450 billion. He was more, he was richer than JP Moreland at, at 430 billion, uh, Rockefellers at 400 billion. He was the richest man who ever lived, and he was a very generous man, and he was known uh, that his people loved him to death. And here's the man outside of Solomon, we know, Mm -hmm. that richest man who ever lived, Mansa Musa, that no one has even heard about or even know anything about. (laughs) And like I said, he reigned right around 1317 to 1337, Mansa Musa. Musa, so, the king of Mali in West Africa. So, who do you? Uh, where do you find out about Mansa Musa from? Uh, just, just Google him. Google him. <laughs> just Google him, <laughs> and, and just hit Google, and it'll come up, <laughs> and you'll be blown away at his kingdom. His kingdom was almost uh, the, uh, I would say, the distance of the. Um, how much uh, Solomon, mm. when he was king, the distance that he had, Mansa Musa in West Africa mm. was a tremendous leader, tremendous king. And they said they really don't know how much money he really had. They just guesstimate mm-hmm. that it was right around 450 wow. billion in today's <laughs> terms. That's amazing. That's amazing. So my, yeah. my recommendation would be um, somebody current, and that would be John Perkins. Uh, John Perkins ah. is 90, yeah. I think he's, he's, if he's 90 for sure, he might be 91. Uh, he was um, a contemporary of Dr. Martin Luther King. Um, mm-hmm. He is today still uh, just one of the most, uh, you know, just amazing men of God, uh, you know, loves the word of God, loves the gospel does mm. does an online Zoom Bible study every week. <laughs> and wow. it's just fascinating. Wow. But his story is extraordinary. And uh, I'm going to recommend some books here for um, our next post that we're going to do. And his story is is definitely at the top of my list. So, hey, Tony, thanks so much for taking this time to do this, my friend. And um, Thank you for having me. All right. Can't wait to see you face to face again. Okay. All right. All right. God bless you. Thank you you again. All right. Bye-bye. All right. All right. Bye.